Good morning. Welcome to Restored Church. We're glad that you're spending some time to celebrate and to be part of the gathering with us today. And here at Restored, we always want to take a minute and talk about transformation, uh, celebrate transformation. We consider that is what Jesus does. He is greater than anything we encounter in our lives. And he takes what we are, who we are, and he transforms us into so much more. I'd love for you to take just a minute and consider his work in your own life, how he's transformed you, how he's made a difference in your life. Think of those around you who know Jesus Christ, who have been following him and walking with him. Consider how he has transformed them. And it's amazing that as we look back and see who we once were and who we are today, that in great hope, because we are still imperfect and in need of much more transformation, we look forward with great hope that as he has begun something in our lives and in our church, he's not even close to being done. And so today, we're going to spend a little bit of time. You're going to get to hear some stories of transformation. I can't wait for you to hear them. But before we get there, take a minute and just consider the transformation that he's already done in your life. Share that with those who are with you. Maybe comment below. We'd love to hear about it. Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cross. 
cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears They laid him down in Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, continue our time together here at Restored Church, we just want to take a minute and welcome you. Whether this is your first time with us, maybe it's your first time in a long time, or maybe you're with us every single week, no matter where you find yourselves, thank you for spending some time with us as we gather together. If this is, in fact, your first time, we'd love to connect with you. You can do that simply by texting the word LIFE to 570-354-0846. That is a simple way in which we can connect with you learn a little bit about you, and get you some information about us. Another way to connect with us is by attending Growth Track. Growth Track is a simple thing that happens every week on Sunday afternoon that helps people go from curious about Restored to connected here at Restored. We'd love for you to get connected with us and learn more about Restored Church. Simply to get information regarding Growth Track or sign up, head over to restoredchurch.org. 
Whenever you are ready, willing, and able, we would love for you to join us for our live gatherings here at the building at the corner of Northampton and South Mead Streets in Wilkesbury as we meet every Sunday at 9 and 11 a.m. Whenever you're ready, we're waiting for you. A couple other ways that you can connect with us throughout the week, all throughout the region, is through groups. Our community groups meet all different times throughout the week. We'd love for you to engage in community in one of those groups. If you're already connected, that's fantastic. If you're not and you'd like to get connected, you can get some information and get all the ways that you can sign up as well as the groups that are available over at the website at restoredchurch.org groups. We'd love to help you get connected into a group because church is not just an event you attend. It's a community that we engage in. Today, we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to talk through transformation. Man, just celebrating those stories about transformation and how Jesus is greater than everything that we encounter. He's greater than the world. He's greater than sin. He's greater than death. He's greater than the law that condemns us. I mean, he's greater than all of that. And celebrating transformation is so exciting. And I just want to say thank you real quick, because for many, and maybe this is you, for many people, it is because of your generosity that we get to continue to gather together to celebrate all of those stories of transformation. And I just want to say thank you. If you'd like to continue being generous, you can do that uh, by going over to the website. You can give online on the app as well, or you can head over uh, to um, the actual website and give there um, by going to restorechurch.org slash give. If you're somebody who still uh, sends out checks or anything like that, just mail them straight to the office at 74 South Mead Street here in Wilkes-Barre. The zip code's 18702. Before we get to these stories of celebration, I want to take a minute and pray. Because what we've been doing in these last few weeks is we've started praying for the other churches in our community, the other churches in our city and, and kind of around the city. You see, we don't see all of those churches as competition. Here at Restored, we see them as teammates. And when the goal is that we get to celebrate more and more stories of transformation and Jesus changing lives, they are teammates and there's some great things happening. Today, we wanted to celebrate and pray for South Mead Street Baptist Church. You know, we're celebrating baptisms at our building and you're going to get to hear the stories of those individuals in a minute, but right down the street. South Mead Street Baptist is celebrating baptism as well. And so we just want to take a minute, praise God for them and the stories of transformation happening there. And then we're going to share with you a couple stories about some of those life transformation events that are happening right here at our church. And you'll get to hear some videos before we continue with the gathering after we pray. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much. Thank you for entering into our lives. Thank you for entering into my life and just orchestrating such transformation. You're amazing. I'm so grateful for you. God, as we celebrate baptism and transformation at Restored, man, we know that we are not the only place you are doing that. We want to take a minute this morning and praise you for South Mead Street Baptist Church. They're just down the road and in close proximity to us, and they are just as much as we are. They are part of the Bride of Christ, and they are your church. And God, we want to celebrate them and we want to pray for them because they're having baptisms today as well. They are trans, they are celebrating those transformed lives just like we are. And God, they're different lives, different stories, but you are the one who is orchestrating all of it. We praise you for that. God, we pray for them that their time together would be a celebration, that their time together this morning would be of great delight to you and it would be encouraging to them. God, we just pray for their time together. And as they continue to move forward in whatever you have planned for them, uh, we pray for them. We pray that they would make a dent and a difference here in this city and in this community alongside of us. And we pray for them. God, we thank you. And as we look forward to hearing these stories that are happening here at Restored, we think of them as well. We just pray these things in your name. Amen. Take a minute and watch these videos of life transformation happening here at Restored Church. And later on, you can go over to the YouTube channel at uh, restoredchurch.org slash YouTube, and you can get the actual videos of each one of the baptisms related to these stories. Check them out. Hi, my name is Samantha, and I'm a follower of Jesus. Jesus is a man whom God sent down to earth to pay for our sins and face our worst punishment, death. 
I sometimes find it hard to believe that he, that God would do this just because he loved us. We didn't even deserve it. I became a follower of Jesus when I was three years old. I asked him to forgive me of my sins when I was three years old. I didn't really understand what I was doing at the time. I was just happy that I was like everybody else. I didn't know I was making a lifetime decision to follow Jesus. I didn't really know what it meant until about two years later when I was eight. I had just moved from Michigan to Pennsylvania and I was scared and unhappy. I found comfort in praying at night after my parents had left the room. I had no friends that year and my whole world was turned upside down when COVID struck. I swear I was the most unhappy girl in the whole universe. I had learned to always dread the next day, doing e-learning, keeping two younger brothers underhand, being stuck inside, it was too much. But God helped me through the time. He is still helping me now. We are almost out of COVID and only one family mem member had it, my cousin Elena. I kept her in my prayers and we survived the world pandemic. I want to be baptized because I made a choice to follow Jesus and I want everybody to know that. I pray for our church and the people who lead it. I want to thank everyone for being kind to me and I want to thank Pastor Tim and everybody who made this happen. Thank you, Restored Church. Hi, my name is Lorelai and I'm a follower of Jesus. Before I gave my life to Jesus, I would always go to church, to the church gatherings, and anything that we were doing. But I guess I just didn't really have a personal relationship with God. I became a follower of Jesus about two years ago. I was having some personal problems, and I realized that I needed to pray and have my trust in God, and that He would protect me through those personal problems. Jesus has changed me through the way that I act, through the way that I am talk to people and through the way that I connect with others around me. I want to be baptized because I want to show everyone that I have put my faith and trust in Jesus and that he has saved me from my sins. Hi, I'm Tyler and I'm a follower of Jesus. Before I gave my life to Jesus, my life was an utter disaster. Um, my life was broken. Um, I was a drug addict. I had no no friends. I lost my family. Um, I, I was just alone. And I didn't know what to do with myself. And I finally, my little sister came and told me that I need to go to treatment before she loses one of her best friends in her life. And I decided to go to treatment. And I went to treatment and there was this girl there that would talk about Jesus and it really really caught my eye and for some reason ever since she would talk to me about Jesus and God it really really stuck with me and even when I got sober and clean I uh, I was still struggling in life and I didn't know what to do and I just for some reason I Jesus was the only thing that gave me peace and it was just absolutely incredible that I could ever feel peace and not feel alone anymore. I became a follower of Jesus uh, last year. Um, it was a very incredible moment because um, my grandfather is a follower of Jesus and I never knew that. And I was struggling with both of my brothers, their addiction, and I just was having a really, really hard time. And I would call my pap and he would tell me to pray about it and this and that. and my friend Dan Nichols, um, I texted him one night and I told him, I was like, Dan, I'm ready to be a follower of Jesus. And he just told me to sit down and talk to him. Tell him everything that you're telling me. And that's what I did. And then the next day, I called my pap. My pap was like, you don't have to tell me, Tyler. I already know what you did. I've been praying about it ever since you were born. And it was absolutely, the feeling I had was just... It's very hard to describe, but it just had full peace and the weight was lifted off of my shoulders. Jesus is our Savior. He gave His life for our sins. He gave us forgiveness. And it was just, Jesus is an incredible person. He has changed millions and millions of, of people's lives in ways that we can't even understand. And 
It's just absolutely incredible what he has done for us so we can have forgiveness and have a peaceful life. Jesus has changed me in a lot of ways. Um, I, I have my family back. I have friends. He has brought people into my life that I never thought I could have in my life. He, he's just an incredible person and he's changed me in ways that I honestly can't even describe. And he, he puts me in situations where I know I should be there, even though they're difficult. There's still things that I need to do in this life for him and for God. And I just need to continue to share the, the word of the gospel so other people can find some hope in that. I want to be baptized because it would be my first time in my family's, um, in my parents' family that someone would be as a follower of Jesus. And I want to continue that with my kids and further on and just keep it going because it's it's never really been in my family and I think that's a big part that family needs to put their faith in Jesus and make Jesus the number one in their life. everyone so thankful to be able to spend some time with you today diving into the Word of God this morning before we dive into our message I want to pause for a minute and give you a little bit of a quick overview of a couple things uh, today we're continuing our Jesus is greater series which will actually wrap up next week uh, after that May 2nd uh, we will have Pastor Dan's final Sunday here at Restored so Pastor Dan Nichols, our founding church planter, uh, he and I have had the privilege of working together for a decade now. God has called him and his family to a new church in Cortland, New York, to serve as the lead pastor there. Uh, so Sunday, May 2nd at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. will be Dan's last sermon here at Restored. Uh, we would love to have you join us in person if you are able. If not, that will also be online for you as well. Then for those that are able, willing, and healthy, that evening from 4 to 7 p.m., we'll be having an open house right here at Restored uh, to celebrate Pastor Dan, to honor him as we send them out to a new season of ministry in a new place. Uh, after that, starting on May 9th, we're going to begin a brand new sermon series. Uh, for three months, we're going to walk verse by verse through Paul's letter to Titus. I'm really excited by this, and I think this will be a great time. Well, as we dive into our message, I want to pause and I want to pray. Uh, I don't know about you, but um, myself and my family, we've had kind of a challenging week. Uh, so I think as we approach the Word of God today, it'd be really good for us to pray and ask God to speak to us through His Word. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are good. You are so good to us, and we know that every good and every perfect gift comes from you. One of the ways that we experience your goodness is through your faithfulness. No matter what, no matter what happens, no matter how crazy things are, Jesus, you are on your throne. You are in control. And we praise you and we cling to you. So today as we approach your word, I pray that you would transform us. I pray that we would approach your word wanting to change and that we would walk away from this passage in your word willing to change in whatever areas you're calling us to. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we are continuing our Jesus is Greater series. And as we do that, I think there's something that's true about me and about you. 
we take a lot of things for granted. We can take our family for granted. Maybe it's our, our parents, our spouse, our kids, our siblings. We can take family for granted. We, we can take our friends for granted or work for granted. We can take financial stability for granted. We can take church for granted or our health for granted. And this past year has shown us and awakened us to the reality of how many things we assumed were automatic. And maybe we took them for granted. But now we have awakened to the reality that nothing is guaranteed. And when we realize that nothing is guaranteed, it cultivates in us a greater heart of appreciation and gratitude. You know, as we think about the things that we can take for granted, I believe that we can take Jesus for granted as well. I, I believe that as we, we look at everything that's happening in our lives and all of the things we have competing for our attention. I believe that we can take Jesus for granted. See, maybe you are approaching this today and maybe you've been missing the greatness of Jesus altogether. I hope that as we have journeyed through this, that you're beginning to get a picture of the greatness and supremacy of Jesus above all else. I hope that as you see and hear stories of transformation in the lives of those that were baptized today, I hope that that sees you, helps you to see the greatness of Jesus. But maybe you're not new to the greatness of Jesus, but perhaps you've become calloused to the greatness of Jesus. See, maybe you've heard so much for so long about Jesus that the greatness of Jesus doesn't move you anymore. It doesn't put you in awe of who he is and what he's done. Maybe if, if you're honest in the, in, the, in the darkest parts of your heart, maybe you are numb to or bored by the centrality of the gospel in the life of the believer. Here's the reality. If you do not cling to the gospel richly and deeply, you will consistently return to being condemning, anxious, insecure, joyless, distracted, and angry all the time. It is our foundation in the gospel that keeps us rooted in Christ. And rather than taking Jesus for granted, we want to look at the richness of his forgiveness today. What we're talking about today is everything that we see pictured in baptism. We're seeing that Jesus is greater than sin. And to help us focus on this, I want to look at Colossians chapter 2. We're just going to look at verses 12 to 15 uh, today. So Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 12, says this, For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So this letter is written by the Apostle Paul to the early church in Colossae and Laodicea. He's reminding them in this letter of the greatness of Jesus and the foundation of the gospel. Paul's communicating that to them in a very protective way because he wants to protect against false teaching that was spreading throughout that region. We had the privilege last community group cycle of spending 10 weeks doing an inductive Bible study of the letter of Colossians. We walked verse by verse through this as a group. We studied it all week long and then we came together and we shared what God was teaching us through his word. And what I'm continually amazed by in Colossians is there is so much packed in here. There's so much packed in here about the greatness and supremacy of Jesus. We saw some of that last week when we talked about that in our message that Jesus is greater than the world when we looked at Colossians chapter 1. And in this passage, Colossians 2, we see that Jesus is greater than sin. Look at verse 12 and what is said here. 
for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. Today, in person in our gatherings, we're celebrating three people going public with their faith in Jesus. And see, what we find is that in baptism, we are identifying with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. But to be perfectly clear, baptism does not bring anyone into right relationship with God. What baptism does is baptism pictures the gospel in the lives of those who have entered into relationship with God. See, when we come by faith to Jesus and we ask him to forgive us, we place our faith and trust in his perfect life, death, and resurrection on our behalf, then we become children of God, followers of Jesus, and we identify with Christ through baptism. Paul writes here that you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. The word baptize means to uh, immerse. So baptism is a picture of the good news of Jesus and what happens to us. We like to say that baptism is an outward act of an inward fact. So when someone goes under the water, it's the picture that they are buried with Christ. Their old life is gone. Their old life is dead. But then we go on and we see that we are raised to new life in Christ. And when someone comes back up out of that water, it is a symbolic picture of what has happened, that you and I are raised to new life in Christ. Because Jesus rose from the grave, everything changed. We identify with him through baptism, that we are buried with Christ and that we are raised to new life in him. See, here's the reality. True, lasting, heart-level transformation is only possible through Jesus. Paul says that we have been raised to new life because we trusted, trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Trust. Ultimately, when you boil it down, that's what faith is. Saving faith that enables us to enter into relationship with God is trusting. Not in ourselves, not in our goodness, not in our ability to reach God, but no, saving faith is trusting in Jesus alone to restore your relationship with God. Trusting in who he was, fully God, fully man. Trusting in what he did, dying in our place for our sins, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, fulfilling his promise to come back to life again. One author wrote that faith is simply the attitude of coming to God with empty hands. See, we come to God with empty hands. We, don't, we bring nothing to the table, but understanding our inability to ever reach God on our own, we come to God with empty hands, understanding that we will never be good enough. We will never measure up. We will never be deserving of, nor will we ever be able to earn God's love. Knowing that, we come to God with empty hands, with faith, trusting the power, the mighty power of God, who comes to us and says, I know that you will never be able to reach me on, my, on your own, but I came to you. We come with empty hands saying, God, I bring nothing. But I accept everything that Jesus did in my place for my sins to forgive me and to make a relationship with you possible. See, what Paul does in the next verse is he then contrasts. He contrasts this, being raised to new life in Christ, and he reminds them who they were. He says, you were dead. See, all of us are equally separated from God in sin. Paul says that you were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature. We sin by choice, knowing that, that we knowingly disobey God. But we also are sinners by nature. We are born in sin. We start out on the wrong side. We don't start out as a blank slate, trying to figure out if we're going to be good or we're going to be bad. No, we start out bad. We start off in the negative column. We start off as sinners by nature, and because we are sinners by nature, we then sin by choice. And sin carries with it a death penalty. We've committed high treason against a holy and perfect God who cannot accept us in our sinful state. And we are deserving of death because of that. But rather than leaving us on death row, God stepped in. 
See, verse 13 goes on and says, Then God made you alive with Christ. We are given new life through the death of Jesus. Jesus was our substitute. He stepped in. He took our place. He triumphed over sin. And because of that, he made forgiveness possible. There's a theologian that wrote that the early church retained the various metaphors for sin from the Old Testament, but they reframed those metaphors of sin around Christ, life, teaching, death, and resurrection. Here's what that means. Sin is a burden, but one that has been borne by Christ. Sin is a debt, but one that has been paid by Christ. Sin is an offense to a holy God, but one that has been removed by Christ. Sin is an illness, but one that has been healed by Christ. Sin is defiling to, uh, of us, but one that makes us pure through Christ. And in addition to the traditional metaphors, Jewish metaphors for sin, we see in the New Testament battle imagery for one's struggle, knowing that ultimately we are more than conquerors because we are made alive with Christ. We are made alive with Christ. That's only possible because Jesus is greater than sin. Because Jesus is greater than your sin, he was positioned to forgive all your sins. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 that Jesus is not unable to sympathize with our weakness. But no, he was tempted in every way that we are, yet he did not sin. That positioned Jesus to step in as the perfect substitute and sacrifice in our place, the only one capable of providing true forgiveness. See, Paul tells us that we've been made alive with Christ and that he forgave all our sins. Here's what you have to understand, that Jesus didn't just appease the wrath of God. No, Jesus absorbed the wrath of God for us. All of the wrath of God that we deserve poured out on us to die for our sinful, treasonous rebellion against our holy, perfect king, against God himself. All of that was redirected away from us and poured out on Jesus himself. We're told after that, Hebrews chapter 1 tells us that Jesus sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That, that picture of seating, sitting down was a, a picture, it was symbolic of completion of payment. The debt was paid in full in Christ so that lasting, not temporary forgiveness for all of our sins was accomplished once for all by Jesus. See, Jesus is greater than sin. And what happened at that point is that Jesus canceled the record of charges against us. He took it away by nailing it to the cross. There's a really big theological concept that we see here. It's the idea of imputed righteousness. Let me explain this to you. What this means is that Jesus took on our sinful record, but Jesus didn't just take on our sinful record. There was actually a divine transaction where Jesus took on our sinful record and paid the price for it. But then he gave to us his perfection so that when God sees his children, he doesn't see our long record of sinful imperfection. He sees the perfection of Jesus placed on our account. One author has written that Christianity is the only thing that gives you an identity that is received, not achieved. Your identity is not based on who you are, what you do, or how you measure up to cultural norms or moral codes. Your identity is fixed securely in the person and work of Jesus, who canceled the record of debt, that the, who canceled the record of charges that stood against us, and took it away by nailing it to the cross. When Jesus did that, you were given a brand new identity in Christ. See, if you are a follower of Jesus, this is what the Bible says about you. If you are in Christ, in Jesus, you are completely forgiven. 
In Jesus, you are wanted and chosen. In Jesus, you are a trophy of God's grace. In Jesus, you are free from all condemnation. In Jesus, you are a new creation. In Jesus, you are a temple of the living God. And in Jesus, you are a child of God and nothing can ever separate you from his love. That's an incredible, unshakable identity that is only possible because Jesus is greater than sin. Now, when we think about Jesus' triumph over sin, we realize that God's love doesn't pervert his justice. God, in his love, didn't just overlook our sins. No, he took them on himself. God's love does not pervert his justice. His justice was accomplished on the cross. But building on that, God's justice doesn't overshadow his love. Because in his justice, God would have been completely justified to wash his hands and walk away from us saying, you messed it up, you walked away, now you will bear the full consequences of your choices. But rather, Jesus stepped in and bore the full consequences of our choices for us. Romans 3 pictures this for us where it says that God is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. It means that God was fully just and that God did everything necessary in order to declare us right and forgiven by what Jesus did for us on the cross. See, as we, as we think about Christ's victory over sin, as we think about being recipients of his forgiveness, we realize that forgiveness is free to the one receiving it, but it comes at a great cost to the one giving it. Think about it this way. Tim Keller writes, The Christian gospel is that I am so flawed that Jesus had to die for me. There was no alternative. There was no plan B. There was no other way for the debt to be paid, for the price to be paid, for the justice of God to be fulfilled. I am so flawed that Jesus had to die for me. But don't miss this. Yet I am so loved and valued that Jesus was glad to die for me. Isn't that incredible that Jesus stepped in? He canceled the record of wrong that stood against us. He canceled the record of charges against us. He took it away by nailing it to the cross. And in that, Jesus conquered. He was victorious so that we can now boldly and confidently say that Jesus is greater than sin. Verse 15 wraps all of this up for us with a pretty victorious picture. Verse 15 of Colossians chapter 2 says, In this way he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers. He shamed them publicly. What, what does that mean? Well, this is a picture that those in Colossae or those in Laodicea would have been quite familiar with. Because when the Romans would conquer a group of people, what they would do is that victorious Roman general would then lead the conquered captives back into their city for a triumphal parade that would humiliate them. In the same way, Jesus, through the cross, conquered sin and conquered death. And he made a statement to Satan and his army that he had lost. See, it says that Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. This is very reminiscent of what Paul writes in Romans 6, that we were formerly slaves to sin who have now been set free in Christ See, Satan will try to use fear, guilt, and shame to attack you. But Jesus has disarmed him. And he has replaced those traps with hope, forgiveness, and acceptance in the gospel. Jesus has conquered 
once for all. He did everything necessary in order to bring you into right relationship with God. And if you stand today in that place, being given freedom and foundation by Christ, that is something that you and I should never lose the wonder of, should never fail to be put in awe by. See, th this whole conversation about sin is in some ways something that we struggle with. If you're, if you're new to church and the Bible, then maybe you're carrying into this all of your experiences that you've had, and maybe you've heard sin communicated in very judgmental, condemning ways, and it makes you really nervous whenever that topic is brought up. Or maybe you're approaching this as a longtime follower of Jesus, and you've lived long enough to pile up a lot of regrets about your sin. And whichever end of the spectrum you're on, whether you're new to the Bible and have felt really judged and condemned, or whether you're a longtime follower of Jesus and you are really self-condemning of yourself, both of those realities can produce in us a deep spiritual insecurity. And when we approach God from that place of spiritual insecurity, the thought of no, God knowing us fully is scary because we know the darkest parts of our lives and our stories. And knowing that God knows that is really hard. See, one author writes that to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. See, you might be in a place where you are lo fully loved, but you're not fully known. And so that love feels superficial. You always have that nagging question in the back of your mind. What if they find out about this? Will they still love me or will they give up on me? And in some ways, it can be easy for us to think that way about God. Will God still love me? And at some point, will God get frustrated and give up on me? See, to be known and not be loved is our greatest fear with God and others. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything else. It liberates us more than anything else. It liberates us from pretense, humbles us out of self-righteousness, and fortifies us for any difficulty that life can throw at us. See, we get a picture here in Colossians 2 that Jesus willingly and joyfully conquered over sin so that we can stand victorious today. You were fully known and fully loved by God before Jesus ever came. Actually, it is because you were fully known and fully loved that Jesus chose to come. Because he wanted a relationship with you and he took it upon himself in order to make that possible. But as we think about the greatness and supremacy of Jesus, this is vitally important for us because the way that you view Jesus impacts the way you view yourself and others. See, if you primarily view Jesus as a religious leader, you'll see yourself as a failure who isn't measuring up, and wallow in guilt and shame when you struggle. If you primarily view Jesus as a rule enforcer, you'll see others as a constant frustration because of your unrealistic perfectionism. But if you primarily view Jesus as your Savior, you'll forgive like He forgives because you realize how much you've been forgiven. I think what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6 really helps us to understand this even more. Paul says, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin, who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he finishes up and says, Some of you were once like that. But you were cleansed. 
You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. You might find yourself easily and obviously on that list of things that separate us from God. That list of people and the things that define them. But if you're a child of God, realize that that is no longer who you are. Paul refers to that in past language. Some of you were once like that, but now you've been cleansed. See, the forgiveness that Jesus accomplished for you on the cross cleansed you. Or as Colossians 2 put it, that he canceled the record of charges against us. He took it away so that you and I could be cleansed. We're cleansed of our sin because of Jesus. But it doesn't stop there. You were made holy. You and I fall short of holiness and perfection all the time, like we talked about last week. But because of Jesus, we're made holy. We are set apart. We are children of God. We are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's beloved Son. Because we've been made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the work that the Spirit of our God has done to transform us in our lives. Jesus is greater than sin. That is an unshakable reality. See, we're told in Hebrews 4 that because of Jesus and his perfection in our place, we can boldly approach God's throne of grace to find mercy and help in time of need. Here's what's amazing about this. When we consider this reality that Jesus is greater than sin, think about it this way. Rather than leaving us to rot in our rebellion, Jesus left the comforts and glories of heaven to find us, to seek and save that which was lost. Rather than clinging to his rights and privileges as God, Jesus gave those up so that we don't receive the punishment we deserve for our rebellion against God the Father. Rather than being unwilling to pay the price, Jesus paid the price with his life so that we could be restored to the family of God. Rather than hoarding everything to himself, Jesus made it possible for us to be co-heirs with him as children of God. And rather than being angry, over all that he had to do to clean up our mess, Jesus joins in on the celebration for the lost being found. We're told that all of heaven rejoices over one sinner who repents. Today, if you are a follower of Jesus, know that heaven is rejoicing over you and the work that Christ has done in your life. We join in on the celebration today as we celebrate with those who have gone public with, uh, public with their faith through baptism. And we celebrate the greatness of Jesus, who is greater than death, greater than the world, and greater than sin. Let's pray. Jesus, we are astounded by your forgiveness. And we stand here in a completely undeserving place in awe of your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness to us. I pray that as we behold your greatness, that you would produce in us hearts of gratitude for all that you are and all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.
mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend the agonies of Calvary you the perfect holy one Christ your son drank the bitter cup reserved for me your pride has washed away my sin Jesus thank you Father's wrath leave me satisfied Jesus thank you one to end me now seated at your table Jesus thank you by your perfect sacrifice I've been but your enemy you've made your friend of your glorious grace, your mercy and your kindness overwhelm. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus, Thank you. Lover of my soul, I want to live. Your table, Jesus, Jesus thank. 